And the fact that I can harness scalar energy in this instrument, and then I can broadcast scalar energy through the universe without the need of an infrastructure, tells me that I've tapped into consciousness or intelligence. This instrument controls scalar energy or consciousness. All right, today's podcast is about the secrets of scalar light, and it actually is kind of a secret because not that many people know about it. And according to Tom, this is the work of Nikola Tesla in the second half of his life. And what he is doing, he is self-stating that he is continuing Nikola Tesla's work. So what you're about to listen to is a very in-depth conversation about scalar light and how it works. And it is fascinating. This is not by any means a boring podcast. And if you enjoy this podcast, consider supporting it on Patreon to keep more podcasts like this coming. Without further ado, let's get into it. All right. Well, Welcome to Universe Game, my man, and uh, you're a very interesting guy, and one of the connections that I always find fascinating is Nikola Tesla. I try to look and see where his work connects. I've had people on that have talked about him before, but you've got a very interesting one uh, around scalar light. So from what I understand, I did some research on you, you're continuing the work, the, the second half of the work of Nikola mm -hmm. Tesla, what he did with scalar. Right. That's correct. Uh, I'm working with scalar energy instruments, what Tesla would call radiant energy. And mm -hmm. Tesla was right. There's two energies. There's an electromagnetic spectrum and there's a radiant spectrum or a scalar energy spectrum. I prefer to work with scalar energy, scalar light. It offers greater uh, promise. It, it's a much more uh, promising technology. Mm -hmm. So you're, when we're talking about scalar light, I mean, I think it's important just to really get a solid definition. From what I understand, it's the energy of the sun that you're harnessing, yes. even the energy of the atmosphere as well. And you're using that to transmit to people's bodies. And then therefore, when the energy gets transmitted, it heals them. That's correct. That's correct. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> scalar energy, what is it? It's the energy of the sun and the stars. It is the primal force in the universe. We, we have to take a macro view of the universe and we have to say to ourselves, well, what drives the universe? What's the animating force? It's energy. It's light, which is fundamental. And then what drives the sun and the stars? Because that's where the light comes from. That's the storehouse of light. It's always been my contention that starlight, in its very quintessence, is scalar energy. It's not electricity. So we're working with the the light of the universe, which is scalar light, the light of the stars. Hmm. Okay. And so is the general premise that people are struggling with their health because they don't have enough of it? Yes. And they don't have it in, in the right information. <clears throat> if scalar energy represents the primal force of the universe, then that primal force instructs the universe. And if we keep at that primal motif, that theme, that motif, will have perfect health. Perfect instructions, perfect light will translate into perfect health. Why don't we have perfect health? We don't have perfect light. That's why. So, okay, so that just a random question that comes up is would someone that does not get as much sunlight need this more than someone does and what's the difference between going out into the sun and getting scalar light in your form? Yeah. <clears throat> When we when we are outside in the sun, you're re you're receiving two energies: electromagnetic energy and scalar energy, and both are have their consequences, and both are good within a certain measure. But what what the point I'm trying to drive at is today, sadly, academia has ignored this other science, scalar science. There's two energies. Tesla knew that. He discovered that. I, I've re have I have rediscovered that. So scalar energy is a new realm of health. I want to make this very clear to the audience. When we're working with scalar energy, it's non-physical. It's informational. So while I'm going to speak about informational science, scalar light science, that has nothing to do with biochemical reactions. I don't work with people. I work with force fields. So I don't work with flesh and blood, so to speak. I work with energy fields. There's a gigantic difference. And on account of the fact that I work with energy fields, there's no biological downside. There's no biological drawback to what I'm doing. It's non-biological. So my work with scalar energy is spirit. <clears throat> it's information. It's non-physical. And this is a new branch of healing for people. It's quantum healing. 
So how do you see the role of spirit in this? Because I think that's interesting. Yeah, okay. Well, if I look at scalar energy, what I've observed and what I can prove thus far, there's not a protein involved. There, uh, the proton, excuse me, or a neutron. It's non-physical. It's, it's pure essence. It's pure information. Now, with that in mind, this has to be the spirit realm. If it has intelligence, if it has meaning, but there's no physicality, there's no atoms or, or electrons or, or molecules involved, it has to be an information system of pure spirit, non-physical. So in many ways, my work with skin energy proves the spiritual dimension. And everybody has a spirit and everybody has a physical body. Keep in mind, I don't work with the physical body. I work in the scalar energy dimension, which is non-physical, which is spirit. Oh, it proves the spirit. That's what I've been trying to do for a long time. <laughs> trying to figure out okay. how we can get this. Like, how can we understand what the spiritual realm is? You know? Yeah. So when so you, that's that, a big claim, and I love it, it, it but is. I want to hear more. <laughs> These are scalar energy instruments that do not control electricity. They harness scalar energy. And the fact that I can harness scalar energy in this instrument, and then I can broadcast scalar energy through the universe without the need of an infrastructure, tells me that I've tapped into consciousness or intelligence. This instrument controls scalar energy or consciousness. And when I use this instrument, I do not have to create the infrastructure. There's no satellite. You don't need substations. You don't need wires. You don't need circuits. You simply work with this instrument in concert with the universe. It works hand in hand with the universe. You don't create power plants. You don't create relay stations. So this is the inbuilt infrastructure of the universe. And this instrument will access that infrastructure. You're accessing consciousness or the mind of God. Okay, so that that brings up an interesting point. So I actually am a proponent that there is a universal mind, and it's interesting that you bring that in. How do you see God in this role? I mean, is this basically the life force of God? I kind yes. of feel like it's kind yes. of like a prana or, you know, chi, or it's the, the, the subtle energy fields that maybe these other traditions have been describing. Precisely. Other terms synonymous with scalar light are prana, chi, consciousness, universal life force, spirit, ohm, uh, torsion energy, orgone energy. So we have electricity, which is one spectrum. And then the other spectrum, scalar energy, is the non-physical spectrum that, that societies, that, that people, that cultures have embraced for centuries. They've never been able to quite create an instrument to, to control it, I have. But I, I have discovered consciousness by way of instrumentation. Okay, so you think that this is old technology, essentially, yeah. just rediscovered. Correct. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'll All give right. you, for instance, uh, many yeah. of the pyramids and obelisks today are scalar energy capacitors. If you look at many pyramids and obelisks that have been, even cathedrals, they capture, they harness scalar energy. So their geometry, their design passively would capture, harness, store scalar energy. Well, what, what you can do with certain cathedrals and obelisks, I can do with an instrument. So this is not a new concept. What is new is the fact that we now can control it and broadcast it, direct it. Interesting. Okay. So there is, I've seen some content about how if you take a pyramid, there's mm -hmm. a specific energy field that you can only get from that shape. Yes. And so that's essentially what we're saying is that there's yes. different, different energy fields that you can only get through certain formats. That's right. just wild to think that the universe works like that. You know? uh, isn't that profound? I actually, yeah. and w with one of my techniques, I've created a copper pyramid, and I place this copper pyramid on top of, I surmount it on top of my Tesla coil. And that copper pyramid allows me to oh, almost 
amplify my scalar wave. Meaning what? Certain geometric forms allow me to amplify the scalar wave. Well, that's proof that there is geometry to the universe. And once we work hand in hand with the universe, with certain geometric forms, we can enhance a scalar wave. So how did you stumble upon this endeavor in your life? Because this is a very nuanced thing to do. And I feel like there's not a lot of people that be willing to go against the grain of the way that we get energy. And there's a lot of sketchy things that happen. So what led you to this conclusion that this is what you want to do? I was an avid reader throughout my entire life. As a youngster, I was reading about Tesla. Now, this is before computers. This is back in the 70s. And when I would read about Tesla, I'd have to buy a book. I said to myself, he was on to something. And he, he's just brilliant. Just absolutely brilliant. And I knew he was working with the life force energy later in his life. Tesla described he had a tower in Colorado Springs. And this tower in Colorado Springs, if you look very closely at the photographs, there's no power plant around. Back in 1899, Tesla built a scalar energy tower on the outskirts of Colorado Springs. And, you know, at 6,000 feet at the turn of the century over 100 years ago, that was a, a ranching community. So why would he go out to Colorado Springs to build a tower? Because that tower could access the free energy in the atmosphere in the Rocky Mountains. And he was able to create artificial lightning. Lightning is a scalar energy discharge. Lightning is not electrical in, in its conception. So if you look at all of his work and you say to yourself, wow, all of those are signs, indications that he was no longer working with electricity. He was able to access the free energy of, abundantly available in the Rocky Mountains and that he was even able to create artificial lightning bolts, lightning, which is scalar energy in, in character. By golly, that's a scalar energy researcher. He's a scalar energy scientist. He was the first. I heard there was something to do with that. You're talking about the Tesla Tower, right? Yes, the Tesla Tower. Mm -hmm. So was there also something to do with the, tell me if it's true or not, maybe it's not, yeah. the ground and getting mm -hmm. something to do with the water in the ground maybe or you know, using that to get energy as well? Yeah, now... <clears throat> Yes. And, and why? Because water is a great capacitor for scalar energy. It has an affinity for scalar energy. Now, what was the water table like in Colorado Springs in 1899 at 6,000 feet? I don't know. But for some reason, Tessa felt comfortable that he moved his laboratory from New York City to Colorado Springs and built a tower. So he had this vision. <clears throat> Will water abet a scalar energy instrument? Yes, because it's a capacitor. It can draw in more scalar energy. Exactly why Tesla built a tower in the Rocky Mountains, I don't know why. But obviously he knew what he was doing. And it was a functioning instrument. And I could, I could prove that it was scalar energy because he was able to plant light bulbs in the ground. <clears throat> Actually put, place a light bulb in the dirt, in the ground without wires. And he was able to illuminate the, uh, the light bulbs. And he was al also able, and I can prove in, in theory, what he was doing was a scalar energy project. When he would turn his instrument on, in town, in Colorado Springs, some of the, uh, <clears throat> some of the fire hydrants experienced an electrical discharge, and even some of the horses um, had an electrical discharge on their feet, on their hooves. And I've experienced that in my laboratory, in which I start with scalar energy, but it degrades into electricity. So if I can see the degradation of a scalar wave into electricity, and I've actually had a shock in my laboratory, an electrical shock from my scalar energy instrument, that's because I start with a scalar wave, but it always degrades into electromagnetic energy. And then <clears throat> by way of comparison, Tesla's scalar energy tower created scalar energy, but by the time that scalar wave reached the town, it had discharged into electricity. And this is why you found sparks emanating from the fire hydrants in Colorado Springs, proving my theory that what starts with scalar energy in this world will eventually degrade into electricity.
So it's like you're looking at a spectrum and further along the spectrum, like most people look at the electromagnetic spectrum, you've got like visible light, then you've got maybe down the line, gamma rays, x-rays. You're saying even beyond that, just take, take that further, right? Yeah, well, let, let me just say this. It's sort of, use this analogy, when you have a coat and some coats are reversible, one side is the color gray, you reverse the coat, the other side is blue. Well, they're two distinct colors. There's just as scalar energy is a distinct energy from electricity. But I have found that scalar energy will usually degrade, convert into electromagnetic energy. So what am I getting at? The stars always initiate scalar energy. But by the time that scalar energy reaches planet Earth, most of that has degraded into electromagnetic energy. If you were to live in the center of a star, there's no electricity in the center of a star. You would live in eternally inside a star. There, there could not be death. I got to think about that one. So, so what are you saying? The, you're saying the, star, the center of a sun is not hot. It, correct. Very good. The center of a sun is benign. Uh, and according to Newtonian physics, which is, cannot explain a star, the star is cool. It is scalar energy that powers a star. Once that energy starts leaving the star, then it degrades into electromagnetic energy. And that's where you have the fire and heat. We've never observed inside the center of a star. If you did, you would find it's 100% scalar energy. It's a benign atmosphere. It's relatively cool. And it really is, a, it's the perfect dimension. It's scalar energy is the eternal dimension. So what am I saying? S star th theory, stellar theory is nonsense. It's nonsense. Okay, so if you're going through a galaxy, like, first off, I just have to ask these days, do you think that the Earth is flat or round? I'm just asking because it the, depends on... The Earth is a globe, but okay. it, it depends on how you look at it and how you define it. Now, if sure. you were to look at the world strictly from the, the, the prism, so to speak, of scalar energy, scalar energy connects, concatenates everything. So there is no point A and point B. So the Earth then could be considered as one point. But if you look at the world from an electromagnetic spectrum, then it has multi-points. It's, it's multi, it, there's many points. What am I getting at? A scalar energy dimension transcends time and space. So if you were just to view the world from the, the viewpoint of scalar light, scalar energy, there is no time and space on planet Earth. Hence, everything is one point. Hence, what's the point of having a globe? Okay, so I'm thinking about that one, and so you're saying that it is a globe. It is a globe, but it's not. Is it, that right? It's, it, it is. <laughs> if, if you look, if you look at the world from from outer space, you'll see that you can photograph it as a globe. However, okay. if you're trying to define those characteristics by way of scalar energy, it, whether it's a globe a pyramid or a flat surface, the geometry does not define it per se. What defines scalar energy is the fact that it transcends time and space. So is space scalar energy? Yes, yes, okay. time is scalar energy. The movement of scalar energy causes time. The fact that scalar energy is everywhere means that it transcends space. The fact that scalar energy is in every time frame will represent the fact that scalar energy transcends time. Now, a scalar wave is very simply stated. A scalar wave rotates. As it rotates, time moves forward. If you were to reverse that rotation, time would move back. If you hold that rotation in suspension, time is held in suspense. Time does not move forward. It's so simple. Hello, I just want to interrupt this podcast and make you mad and just let you know that I'm not affiliated with Tom in any way. So if you think that I'm trying to sell you something, I'm not. OK, so just want to make that clear. And I also want to let you know that there is no ads throughout this entire podcast because the podcast is supported directly by 
viewers like you, people like you who are generous enough to donate to me on Patreon and keep these podcasts going because this is a passion project of mine and it doesn't really make me any money, but I really just enjoy spreading the knowledge and wisdom to the world. And so if you want to support that, like if you want to genuinely help get more episodes out, consider subscribing to the Patreon or donating if you'd like, because it really helps to keep the thing going. And I appreciate every little bit of support. Thanks. So are you saying, are you a time traveler then? Is that what you're saying? That's a good point. Well, let me, let me make this clear. When people send me a photograph, I work with people by way of a photograph. People teleport to my laboratory. That's right. I buy locate. I can buy locate to my laboratory by way of a photograph. You can buy locate Nick to my laboratory by way of a photograph. Meaning what? You transcend time and space. So the photograph carries your signal. I want to make this very clear. I never work with people. I work with signals on photographs. The virtue, by virtue of the fact that I can work with people around the world through their photograph, their photograph by locate, so you can be in two places at once. And hence, that's not Newtonian physics. That's the other physics of scalar energy. And whether the Earth is flat, whether the Earth is a globe or a triangle or a rhomboid, it doesn't matter because we overcome time and space. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's a lot of different things there. First off, I was asking you because uh, finish that question because there's this theory that as we move through space, we're moving into a denser part of the galaxy, and that that's higher energy. And I was curious if if you think that's true or false. I don't have proof of that, but let me say this: if if we get any closer to a star, we're going to feel the effects of scalar energy. And the closer you are to a star, a star, the greater the preponderance of scalar energy you'll feel. And if you, again, were inside the very center of a star, which is the storehouse of scalar energy, it's 100% scalar energy. It's pure light. There's no physical component to it. And this is what drives the stars. There is no fission or fusion inside a star. That's nonsense. And so stars don't run on nuclear fusion. No, they don't. Okay. No. There's a great scientist, uh, Nikola uh, Kozarev, and he, he postulated, he said, now if the Newtonian concept is true, that there should be really a, so many neutrinos in the, in the universe because they're being produced by this star power. All the stars in the universe are producing this, this type of reaction. Let's call it nuclear reaction. Well, there is a, a dearth of neutrinos. So Kozarev did not consider the Newtonian concept correct, nor do I. I think what drives the star, are, are, it's a scalar energy environment. It's not an electromagnetic environment. And by the simple fact that all of these trillions upon trillions of stars and galaxies, sooner or later you would burn out. You would run out of material. You would run out of helium or, or hydrogen or, or, or whatever manifestation. It has to be self-perpetuating. So if you have any type of model that describes the star and, and stellar activity and it involves entropy, it's false. Entropy, the weakening of a signal, the degradation of matter or the degradation of, of energy, call it what you will. If any model, any model has entropy that, that defines a star, it's false. Stars are eternal. You cannot have an eternal stars with entropy. So it doesn't burn out. Correct. It doesn't burn out. So what doesn't have entropy? Scalar energy. Scalar light. Only scalar light can, can prove and, and can be used to, to support this model of, of stellar activity. That's so simple. would electromagnetic energy be, I'm just hypothesizing, would that be scalar light that does have entropy or you don't consider that to be entropy? At the very center of a star, this is my fist. This is the very sure. center of a star. It's the essence of God. It's scalar light. And when it, scalar light starts to leave that environment and find its way into the photosphere of a star, it starts to degrade into electricity and magnetism. And in so doing, it gives off a great deal of heat. So you can call it the photosphere of, of the star of the sun. The outside, the corona, there's tremendous activity. Because you're converting from scalar, what some people call cold electricity, 
into electromagnetic energy. And it's violent. It's a violent conversion. But the very center of a star, and even Kozarev, who, who, this Russian astrophysicist who developed telescopes, he would look at stars and he would say, that's scalar energy. That's not, a, that's not an emanation of electricity. The very center of a star was, was a scalar energy environment. <clears throat> and he, furthermore, he proved that. He took his telescope, which was a scalar energy telescope, and Kozarev could pinpoint the exact position of a star that it, the star is in right now, not the previous position. But what am I getting at? If, if my finger represents a star 10-year light where... 10 light years away. It's taken that star 10 years to, for that energy to reach us, that light. Kozarev had a telescope that could pinpoint the exact position of a star, not the previous position of a star. So if this finger represents the star as we see it today, in which it took 10 years for the light to, to reach us, then that star is no longer in this position, but in this position. So Kozarev developed scalar energy telescopes that show the exact position of the star, not the electromagnetic telescope that showed the previous position 10 years ago. Why? Because there's two energies. There's an electromagnetic energy that could take a star, the energy of a star 10 years to reach us, or a Kozarev telescope that would show the exact position of a star. Because there's two definitions of reality. Okay, Nick? An electromagnetic and a scalar. It's that simple. When you realize that there's two energies, then there's two explanations. Simple. It's simple. So what do you can what do you think of this quantum energy and quantum computing and all that? Well, we have to define our terms. Let, <clears throat> let's sure. say that in the world of physics, many physicists are realizing that there is a non-physical dimension, which a lot of people have been calling consciousness ohm or chi or prana. And, and thank God we're, we're catching up to these uh, ancient cultures that have always recognized spirit or, or some type of supreme force. Now, as far as computer uh, uh, computation, computers are still using electromagnetic energy. And I, I don't mean this to be a derision to anybody, but our current computer knowledge is is going to be eventually passe once we factor in scalar energy to power our computers. Our computers are slow. The memory is limited. Once we shift into this, this quantum field, scalar energy force field, once we have scalar energy computers, they'll, they'll far out distance an electromagnetic computer. Right. Okay. So there, there, there is that. That's true. And then what I'm referring to when I say quantum computing, there's this new kind of arena where they're now taking, uh, they're using their computations on like protons, and okay. they're they're using the the power not through what it usually was coded with, which is what our electromagnetic spectrum kind of what we do right now, but that's what they're calling quantum computing. Um, you're basically computing on these things that are part of what they consider to be some of the smallest particles um, that you can compute on. I just heard Michio Kaku talk about how this is the smallest thing that you can compute on. Mm. Uh, and so what I'm referring to is, is there a way that you could use scalar energy for computations? Yes. I don't know it's if you've thought about that, but... Yes, it's done every second. Scalar energy is the perfect information system. The fact that we have a universe and it's orderly shows that the star energy, the star intelligence, is always ordering everything. Everything from a molecule to our brain waves to the distant galaxy. So all of that computing is inherent in a scalar wave. So this is what I like about scalar energy. You don't have to program it. It's already programmed by God. So if that's what we're getting at, quantum programming, in which we, we've already ascertained the smallest particle or, the, or the, the fundamental physical form, or the fu fundamental uh, energy, well then, yes, yes, I resonate with that. And that has to be scalar energy. Okay, so <laughs> I just thought of the question that would be perfect no, to ask you. Good. Okay, so this is going to be kind of random, but I don't know if you've seen this trend. I don't know how much you're online. 
But there's people that like to wear pyramids on their heads, mm -hmm. and it's not like a full pyramid. It's like a what? It's like a I don't know how to describe it. It's like have you seen this gold pyramids? But they're like yeah, just the it. wire parts. I yeah. seen just the wire, not not with the complete face. Yeah, go on. Right. Is, is that legit or is it dumb? I've wondered for my it's the first no. time I saw that. What is that it, about? It it has to have some bearing. Now, to how effective it is, I don't know. But any pyramid will collect energy, scalar energy. I'm going to now segue. You've heard of a dunce cap. There's a science behind a dunce cap. Okay, I'm, I'm going to fashion a cone. If this is a dunce cap, and it's a cone now, it's not a pyramid, and, they, and people were made to wear a dunce cap, the science behind that is any cone will project scalar light, scalar energy, into the person, into their brain. And there is, a, there is scientific proof that certain types of dunce caps placed atop the head will channel, will funnel a greater manifestation of scalar energy into the mind and the brain. Will that help you with thinking, cognition? Yes. There is a science behind a dunce cap. So a pyramid on the head is kind of similar to that, yeah? Yes, correct. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Have you dis have you discovered any other forms? Like, uh, I think uh, when we're talking about different geometric shapes, I've gotten into math recently uh, with the help of Robert Grant, and um, I've been talking to him, and he's a very interesting lad. And he talks a lot about all these different shapes that basically construct the universe. And there's also other people like. I've seen Dewey Larson's work. I don't know if you've seen it with time, space, space, time, the reciprocal system saying that the universe is actually split into two. There's we're in space slash time. And then the inversion is time slash space. So it would be time over space. And it basically inverts the dimensions from three dimensions of uh, space, one dimension of time to three dimensions of time, one dimension of space. So there's this, theory that's been going around that it's been around for a long time too that maybe that's how the universe works and this work kind of reminds me of that in a sense because what we're experiencing might be electromagnetic energy but there's a kind of a reciprocal i don't know because when you were talking about wearing a coat that is two different colors that reminded me of like the inversion of time space into space time right. Right. and how his theories was that he called it the metaphysical realm was time space and we're yes. experiencing the physical and then there's the metaphysical. So would you say that, I know that's a simplified description, but does that make sense in the, your system with scalar energy that basically the metaphysical world is the scalar world? Yes. Let's, let's call the metaphysical world, the world beyond physicality. It's, it's actually not a physical construct. It's a spiritual construct. And if that's the case, and this is what is meant by metaphysics, yes. But that only makes sense. For instance, before you build a home, you have instructions. You have an architectural plan, correct? The building, the actual building material, that's the final stage. Now, the architectural plans of the universe are scalar energy, non-physical instructions. The, 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 the end game are planets. Our moons. That's that's the final. That's the end game. A physical construction. Well, why? If that's true for the universe, from non-physical to physical, for for building a home from non-physical architectural plans to the home, the physical abode, then I agree with that motif, and it, it works. Okay. I feel like I understand the concept of scalar pretty decently. Now I need to know why. Tom, yeah. tell me why did God do this? Why yeah, is this happening? You're absolutely right. I, I, God has a spiritual world and a non-physical a, a non world and a physical world. Let's call it non-physical and physical. Why did God want non-physical? Non I firmly believe that angels are non-physical. They're composed of scalar light. I believe man is physical, who has both spirit and body. But why did God design the universe this way? We don't know. But, but let me lend it, this to the argument. Why do I think scalar energy is non-physical? Anytime I've heard of teleportation, 
or any time I've I've understood that uh, you somebody can transport or somebody can move about freely in a scalar energy environment, they are transcending time and space. And it appears from what I've seen is that they always become non-physical. Once you enter into the scalar energy realm, your physical body becomes a, a scalarized body becomes non-physical. It becomes angelic. So would the soul be scalar energy? Would yes. you think that the soul is part of the equation or not? Yes. Yes. Okay. Everybody has a soul. Our soul is with us forever. Our soul is immortal. What makes our immortal soul? It's the same energy that makes the stars immortal. If we have a a, a star inside us, our our soul, that soul is immortal. Just like the stars are immortal. So how do you see death in the system? Death is on account of the fact that we're no longer connected to God's light. If we lived in a perfect state, which is a heavenly state, we could not die. Death and disease are, are, are impossible in a scalar energy environment. Why do we die? We live in an electromagnetic environment. If you read the Bible, it speaks about people who live 300, 400 years of age. Why? There was, there was a stronger scalar energy force field. Today, our, for, our electromagnetic force field is very strong. You're, you're fortunate if you make it to 90 or 100 years of age. If you read in the Old Testament, many people were living to three, 400, 500 years of age. Why? It was a very strong scalar energy force field that slowed down their aging. How did that change? How did the environment on Earth change, do you think? Yeah, for some reason, God has diminished the, the impact of scalar energy. We, apparently, we had a much stronger scalar energy force field. And the, you know, this can really account for the fact that wildlife proliferated, people proliferated. If you and I lived 300 years of age, to be quite frank, we would have many children. And if we did not suffer from, from common ailments and we could live a robust life, you'd have some families with 20, 30, 40 children. You do right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I get what you're you, saying, yeah. You see, you see my point. Yeah. In other words, the, the flora and fauna of the world would also flourish, you know, including many of these prehistoric, uh, what they call prehistoric animals. So that, you know, that I, I can't go back that far. I can't prove that. But, you know, there, there was a time when the scanner energy force field was much stronger and people had an enhanced sense of well-being and they could live to age 300 or 400 without without the consequences that we have for old age today. Okay, so when you say God, we've we've talked about God. This word is very uh, nuanced for a lot of people, depending on what the background is. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm very curious as to what your definition of God is. The supreme being. God is the uncreated supreme being. Now, if if we look at the universe and we're trying to e explain the universe, Everything has a cause. Everything. You can go back to something and something caused that something created that. In order to have, in order for there to be a God, he has to be uncreated. So he, God has to be the, the eternal being that, that is not dependent upon anything. So God is the supreme being that is uncreated. So He's the creator, He's the creator. So when you think about the universe, you're on the Universe Game Podcast. I've got to ask the question: Does the universe seem like a game to you at all? Do you think there's a possibility? Do you think it isn't a game? There's no wrong or right answer. I'm just curious as to your perspective. There, there is a God. I come from a Christian background. There is a God, and there's a purpose to life. Mm -hmm. And. I think people will find their, their greatest meaning when they work hand in hand with that law, with that philosophy, with, with, those, with those tenets. Now, mm -hmm. a, a, a world when you're working hand in hand with God and you're doing God's will, it makes sense. A world opposed to God, you're opposed to nature. You're opposed to morality. That's chaos. This is what we see today in the world. 
a world that's not working hand in hand with God in the sense of morality and, and concomitantly in the sense of working with nature. You're contradicting God. You're contradicting nature. What do I like about my work? I work hand in hand with God. This is God's light. I don't create scatter energy. God did. I'm simply working hand in hand with light. So I'd like to get into this concept of God's will because I think it's very interesting because there's been a lot of people who have interpreted God's will differently, and some people have killed others because they thought it was God's will. So I'm not saying that God's will is bad nor good. I'm not saying I know what God's will is, but I'm curious as how do you define knowing what the truth of God's will is so that you don't become chaos in itself? Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> um, I think it really goes back to the the lesson in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve could not distinguish between right and wrong, which is really a, a question of morality. Today, we cannot distinguish between right and wrong. So I know this is tough on some people, but only God can distinguish what is right and what is wrong. Because otherwise, you, you've seen so many interpretations of, of the law or what is right or what is wrong or what should be or should not be. And it, it's a failure. Mankind is, is proven not to be the greatest of philosophers. Man, <laughs> mankind cannot distinguish between right and wrong. When it comes to a question of morality, it's only God who can distinguish between right and wrong. How can Jesus, we start to, though? How can we? Well, <clears throat> from a Christian standpoint, I would say follow the Ten Commandments. You know, many scientists, they, they, they feel emboldened about the laws of science, and they should be, because that... That gives you the spine. That, that gives you the, the roadmap to travel on. Well, if, if you're a, a moralist, then you want to follow some type of morality, some type of laws. And likewise, there are basic tenets. There are laws, fundamental laws. I'll call them the Ten Commandments. Now, there has to be order in the universe. There has to be order in the scientific universe. There has to be order in morality. And once you find those laws and you follow them, you have harmony. It works. As soon as you go against the laws, whether you like it or not, you, you'll have chaos. You'll have de death and destruction. So you kind of see yourself as the <clears throat> orchestra a master here, the conductor, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're the one who, there's like a someone who's created you to give the ability to give you yeah. the... Uh, really the way of figuring out how do I basically take this from nothing or what seems to be nothing, turn it into music. It's yeah. like, that's kind of what you're doing because yes. I feel when I was looking at your work, that part of it we haven't talked about is the ability to work with DNA. And yeah. if you're working, you kind of mentioned it earlier a little bit, how you can maybe unwind and you can get the harmony within DNA. And it kind mm -hmm. of reminds me of good music versus bad music. Yes, and how when the music is playing in a way that is uh, harmonious, then your body becomes harmonious. Yes, no, thank you. I'm going to demonstrate this to your audience. If I were to take a photograph of a microbe, this is the Epstein Barr virus. <clears throat> this photograph shows the DNA. It shows the genetic material of Epstein Barr. If I were to place this photograph inside my instrument, I, my instrument could look at the DNA, the life molecule, and shatter it, bring it to a state of chaos. So how do I get rid of a virus? I take a photograph of the virus. My instrument, by light, instructions, interprets the order of Epstein-Barr and then produces a state of chaos. That genomic form, that DNA, is actually disassembled, shattered, fragmented. I fragment the DNA of the Epstein-Barr virus. Oh, man, but now that brings up a lot of questions because we were just talking about morality, and you get chaos if you don't follow God's word, but yet you're Correct. creating chaos in the virus. <laughs> yes, I am. You're absolutely right. So this is... This yes. is this is God. This is creation. It yeah. has it has order. Sure. I am reducing this virus to a state of chaos. I am shattering the genome of the Epstein Barr virus. I am I'm taking that intelligence, scalar intelligence, 
and telling the molecular bonds, the atomic bonds, to release. The Epstein-Barr virus falls apart. It ceases to exist. Where does it, can it cease to exist? Is there non-existence? Or does it just it transform? Ceases, it ceases to exist as a virus. I've, yeah. I've fragmented yeah. the virus into smaller parts, proteins and, and, and elements. Amino acids. Well, I cannot annihilate matter, but it, the virus as an organism ceases to exist. Okay, so that's essentially how you're <clears throat> healing people. So... I just want to understand this concept of photographs a little bit better. So are you saying that yeah. when you are working with a photograph, you're actually going back in time to the point that the energy, I could be wrong here, the, and you're like using that, it, their energy from that time period, or maybe that's completely wrong and more, maybe but, it's more. When I work with a photograph, the, my photograph, always reports my immediate constitution. So when I place this photograph in the instrument, this photograph might be three years old, but it's, it always records in the present moment. And then I place the photograph of Epstein-Barr right next to, side by side, my photograph, okay? So the energy, the intelligence of Epstein-Barr is entering into my quantum field. It's quantum entanglement. The two force fields are communicating. And I can send the energy of Epstein-Barr into my energy field. So the photograph of Epstein-Barr seeks out and serves as the intelligence for Epstein-Barr to unravel, disassemble, fragment in my quantum field. It's that simple and straightforward because I'm working with energy, which is fundamental. So it doesn't have to do with time. It more has to do with the energy signature of the photograph? Yes. yes. But okay. keep in mind... This photograph might be three years old, but it always reports my immediate constitution, meaning I am time traveling through that photograph. That photograph doesn't capture me three years ago. It captures me now. See, that photograph in the electromagnetic sense is three years old. That photograph in the scattered energy sense is in the present moment. Got it. Does that make sense? Yeah, so could you use this energy to... <clears throat> Messing people up if you wanted to. I'm just yes. asking. Yes, Nick. Now, this is why I, I guard. To. Yes. To answer your question, yes. And I want the audience to know this. This is why I guard the technology. These are very powerful instruments. God has given me inc an incredible responsibility. And this, this is not meant for uh, mass production. I won't. I refuse to. I'm trying to introduce this technology to mankind. But consider the, the ability, if I can work with one photograph a day, then I can work with thousands of photographs a day. This is a tremendous responsibility that God has given me. So from here, you're trying to get the message out there. And from my understanding, when I looked at your website, people can just go on and try it if they want. Is that That's correct? That's correct. That's correct. I offer 15 days of free sessions for anybody in the world. And I do that because I want people to feel comfortable with what I'm doing. A, a scatter energy session that I've defined, this is unique. It's never been done before. The instruments that I have developed, okay, this is groundbreaking. I don't know of anybody else in the world that has this instrument, and hence nobody has my ability. This is a unique instrument. So how do I introduce this to mankind? I introduce this to the world by, by offering 15 days of free session to the world. 15 days of gratis, no, no obligation, free sessions. People have to experience this. It, it, let me give you this analogy. When the first computer came out, you wanted to experience it. You tried it out. When the first iPhone came out, you wanted to experience it. People need the experience. Sadly, my drawback is I'm one individual. There is no research department. It's me. It's my work. So I, 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 don't have a, I don't have a staff that I can refer you to. And there's only so much I can do as one person. Sure. 
So people can check it out at scalarlight.com, right? Yes, correct. Scalarlight.com. When you send your photograph, we're going to balance your chakras. By the way, your chakras are composed of scalar energy. That's why the scalar energy therapy is so effective. We can balance your chakras. We will uh, look for, eradicate microbes, viruses, bacteria, protozoan. And then we can also, with these instruments, I also am able to create, assemble nutrients. I actually take photographs of nutrients. This is a photograph of beta carotene. And I actually, by placing this photograph inside the instrument, the instrument will recreate, will, re, will duplicate, recreate the structure of beta carotene. So I can deliver a nutrient through the photographic intelligence. Is there, this could be completely wrong, but is there a way to use scalar energy to detect what somebody is missing, what they're deficient in? Yes, I, I don't, I've not been able to define that in, in the instrument by objective measurement, but scalar energy in and of itself will be able to detect what mineral is missing in, a, in an organism or in a system. For instance, my predecessor, his name was Hieronymus, he had scalar energy instruments that he could plant into the ground. And he, he discovered that many farmers and ranchers were using these instruments. He called them a pipe, cosmic pipe. And those instruments would remineralize the soil on, the, on its own. Scalar energy would send scalar intelligence into the soil and place magnesium or nitrogen or phosphorus in the soil, whatever the soil needed. Where does so that come seems, from? Exactly. Where did that energy intelligence come from? It's divine. How, you know, how can you, how, how can this possibly so You're work? making physical minerals using this mm -hmm. device. Yes. Yes. Now, how do we do that? <clears throat> Most likely these devices look for the existing elements in the ground and then just rearrange them into phosphorus or calcium or ah. magnesium. This is what I've found with my instrument. If I, this is the molecular structure of beta carotene. So if we place this photograph inside the instrument, what results is this geometric pattern of carbon, hydrogen, et cetera. So it's like a so 3D the printer. Instrument will, yeah, thank you. It is a 3D <laughs> printer. And, and the intelligence is from God. You don't have to program the 3D printer. This is the motif. This is the instruction. This is what I like about my work. There's no human ingenuity here. There's no human reasoning. If I place this photograph of the instrument, the result is that. Hmm. <coughs> wow. Okay, so it, this has some very interesting use cases. How else could you use this, um, this technology, would you think, that we haven't mentioned? Uh, there was a, I want to give accolades to some other researchers. Viktor Grebenikov, a Russian uh, scientist, was able to ascertain that some insects could hover, levitate. So he created a levitating platform. Grebenikov created a scalar energy levitating platform. And in so doing, he mimicked insect flight. Some insects do not fly, they hover, they experience anti gravity. Now, Grebenikov took it a step forward and developed an anti-gravity platform. While he was aloft on this anti-gravity platform, he had a wristwatch that never advanced because he was outside of time. So his wristwatch did not advance because time does not function. Time is not relevant in a scalar energy force field. Grebenikov was able to move about with any g-forces because in an anti-gravity environment, there are no gravitational forces. Sometimes Grebenikov was invisible because a scalar energy spirit body becomes, as a non-physical, becomes invisible to the naked eye. So all of those peculiar characteristics define the spirit body or the non-physical energy, scalar energy. Some people call that the plasma state or the, the spirit state or the angelic state. You just gave me a Quite really good idea. Quite fascinating, but some, yeah. 
think about the fascinating design of the universe. And if you were advanced extraterrestrials, you would be in the sun. That would be where you'd chill because you'd be immortal. If that's true, you would be immortal. You wouldn't age. And you'd be outside of time in some sense. And uh, these primitive civilizations wouldn't be able to get through the corona or the uh, violence of the outside of the sun. So it'd be the perfect place to live. The, the, wow. safest, the safest place in the universe is inside a star. Wow. It's impenetrable. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely that just right. Put a, uh, that just put a piece of the puzzle together, I feel like, for me. Uh, from my Christian background, many times God, Jesus, is referred to as the Son, capital S-U-N. When you worship, you worship on Sunday. So Sunday represents heaven's day. So heaven is inside the sun. Oh, man, it's all making sense. So do you and think that's why Christ consciousness? On that, yeah. So, so is that what Christ consciousness is in a sense? So that's why he could heal people because he tapped into scalar energy if that did happen. Right? That's correct. Yeah. So how do you do that as a human? Can you tell me, like, that's what I want to know. <laughs> how can I? Well, you do it every day, Nick. You, you're, I, I, and I mean every word of this. Everybody in this world is a genius. We just haven't figured out that we're geniuses. Every God has given us scalar minds and scalar hearts. Scalar notions, scalar mind, scalar brain, scalar heart, scalar emotions. So the human mind and the human heart are scalar energy vessels. We're made in the image of God. Everybody has the, the potential to be a super genius, we are, and a super lover, we are. But we we choose to go against God's commandments. Actually, this brings up a very interesting thing. You're talking about scalar emotions. I'm very interested in emotions. Um, there's work by Dr. Dr. David Hawkins who talks about there's different levels of consciousness, and it goes to a thousand, and that's kind of the vibration of the human body. Um, on your in in your worldview, how do you see the role of emotions? Is it something that we just kind of feel? Is it we don't have a certain amount of scalar energy that causes us to feel a certain way? How, how does that work? In many ways, we're in control of our emotions. Um, there are external factors. I will say what I've experienced with my instrument. My instrument can calm some people, so I'm sure the scalar waves from my instrument will rebalance the brain waves or rebalance the seven chakras. Now, with that notion in mind, well, then we're, we have some type of a favorable import upon our, our thinking, our psychology, our spiritual state. I know many people have said in the past that they're no longer addicted to cigarettes or alcohol because of scalar energy treatments. Well, it's been corrective. It's shown itself to be corrective. And, and if it takes away a bad habit, wonderful, praise God. Okay, so you see, uh, do you see emotions as just part of the electromagnetic spectrum? Is it? Do you see it as the? If I'm feeling like, let's say, anger, is that a electromagnetic frequency in the body? Would you say or no? I, I would always say that initially, any thinking or any emotion starts as a scalar wave and will degrade into electromagnetic energy. So our thoughts are are principally scalar waves, but they always degrade in this world to electromagnetic energy. And I can prove that in many ways. And our, our emotions are scalar waves, but they always degrade into a, a electromagnetic current. So both are important in this world. Both, both, it's the traveling, both are traveling partners in so many senses. But both seem to have a, a profound influence on the way we think and the way we feel. But the easiest way to make an impression is not with electricity, but rather scalar energy. Scalar energy is head over heels more effective on our thinking and on our feelings. Do you think that there's a possibility that if you're feeling love, that could be a scalar energy and let's say fear would be electromagnetic? Would that I'd be accurate or no? I would say scalar energy can, can represent as both forms as love and fear. Okay. Um, See, with this energy, if it's fundamental, then it has, then it has universal implications. 
So I do believe scale energy is the fundamental energy of the universe that can cause fundamentally now a favorable state or an unfavorable state. I believe electricity is not fundamental. That's, that electricity is a derivative of scalar energy. So there's only one fundamental energy, scalar energy. Electricity and magnetism are not fundamental. They're an offshoot. They're a, a secondary energy. Are space and time fundamental? Uh, it depends how you, you define it. <clears throat> when, when you're working in a scalar energy force field, you, you immediately overcome, you transcend time and space. So time and space really are created by scalar energy. Scalar energy is the, is the fundamental life force. Um, what is responsible, the, the effect of scalar energy are time and space. Okay, so back in history, we had, for a while, this concept of an ether. We haven't talked about ether. No. Is the ether scalar? Is it just a different word? I think the way, the way Tessa described it, the way I describe it, ether is a physical particle. There, there has to be some small physical particle. And what God has revealed to me, ether is made out of um, quartz. It's quartz. It's, it's, it's a quartz uh, tetrahedron. Ah. So the, the fundamental energy is scalar energy, scalar light. The fundamental particle is ether. Got it. Wow. All right. Well, I think we've hit a lot of interesting things. I think that we have. this should be enough for uh, the first session. I've got a lot to think about. Round one here. And... Uh, <laughs> We uh we covered a lot, so thank you for coming on, man. It was great, uh, very interesting conversation, and it gave me some new perspectives. All right, that's all, folks, for today on Universe the Game here. And if you enjoyed this episode, consider, if you're listening on audio, just uh, following and giving us a nice five-star review, mate. It really helps. And also, if you're listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube then consider hitting the subscribe button because that really helps. The YouTube loves when you do that and they also like when you like the video and it helps to get the video out to more people to hopefully spread awareness of interesting, profound phenomena like this. So if you like it, like it. Awesome. Okay. I'll see you in the next one. Consider checking out a different podcast and we, we've got plenty of good ones, I'm telling you. But until the next episode, Peace.